Welcome to The Warp. I'm Jack Rita. This is my third video in a series on aliens that you can use as any player. Uh, this is the Red Alert edition. So these are going to be the more advanced games or, or aliens that you're going to want to have in a game where the players have a better understanding of the composition of the cosmic deck and strategies for dealing with really powerful aliens. That's what makes an alien red alert. Um, so this is going to be the top 10 as any player and as any player is an alien that you can use uh, irrespective of whether you're the main player, an ally, or not involved in the encounter at all. Typically you'll get to use these powers once an encounter at a minimum um, in some cases, even more than once an encounter. Uh, so they're really good for large group games where you have six, seven, or eight players, because if you have an alien that only works as a main player, uh, you're not going to get as many chances in a game with eight players to use your alien power. So as any player, better for those mixes. And I've got um, custom combo cards that uh, for the different green alert levels, uh, all the aliens are as any player, so it's really good for large groups. And I've got a custom age card for the Cosmic Campaign that forces you to use as any player, and it's designed for large groups. So let's look at the red alert uh, aliens. I'll tell you what they do, why I like them. Uh, I'm going to start actually with an honorable mention, and that is Mesmer. So Mesmer is an alien that came in Cosmic Dominion, and it's a lot of fun to play. I really like this alien, and uh, but I'll explain why I don't think it's in the top 10. Um, so it's the power of mass hypnosis. You may use this power to play any artifact from your hand as though it were any artifact card you name. If you are zapped, you return the card to your hand, but you may then play it normally for its original printed effect, if appropriate. So uh, Mesmer is a lot of fun to play. If you've got an artifact in your hand, then you've got a lot of power about how you want to unleash it. The downside is, of course, if you don't have any artifacts, then you have no power. So um, there's no guarantee that you're going to have artifacts in your hand in small groups or in large groups. So it doesn't really uh, change things too much in that regard. In the uh, Cosmic Con World Championship, Mesmer was one of the aliens in the game. They never got an artifact, and so they were basically defanged for it. But I do love this alien. I've even got a handy Mesmer artifact guide that has uh, all of the artifacts, <laughs> what their effects are, when you can play them. So I like to break out that prop when I'm using Mesmer or when it's in the game so that uh, a player has full knowledge of what they can uh, play in that. But it's not necessarily something that you're going to be able to use every encounter. So even though it is as any player, and you could use it multiple times per encounter, because if you've got four artifacts, you can play all four of them at the appropriate time for whatever effect. I can do a plague. You could do a uh, cosmic zap, a card zap, a force field, uh, a quash, a motion control. Probably not in that order, but that is um, that's why it's fun, but it's... Again, it's dependent on having a particular type of encounter card in your hand. And then once you play it, of course, it's gone. So let's look at the other 10, which you're going to be able to use a little bit more often. We're going to start with a base game alien that uh, first published in Fantasy Flight's edition, and that is Citadel. And the way the Citadel works is during each player's turn, after Destiny is drawn, you may play an attack card from your hand face up next to any planet in any system as a citadel. If a planet with one or more citadels is attacked after encounter cards are selected, but before they are revealed, you may use this power to activate all citadels on the planet. If so, add their combined value to the defense's total for the encounter. If you activate your citadels on a planet and the defense loses the encounter, discard the citadels. If the defense wins, you do not activate the citadels, or, or you do not activate them. They stay in place. So the citadels, if they're effective, they stay around. They're, they're more powerful. And uh, this is a great alien because it really lets you get cards out of your hand. You can put the low attack cards on any planets, any planets where you have a colony. And it will help you to defend that colony when you need to. You can put it on a, a planet where you share a colony with somebody else, and that can be part of your deal. You can say, look, I'll, uh, we'll make a deal. I'll put a citadel on that planet in the next encounter. And uh, so the player's like, all right, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. 
That way you can activate them when you need to, to defend that colony. Um, it also makes you an attractive ally for the defense. So if somebody's being attacked where there is a citadel and you can say, look, if you bring me along as an ally, I'll either will or won't activate the citadel, depending on which side citadel is on. So also the soft benefit is because you're getting these cards out of your hand more quickly, you are drawing hands more, more frequently. So that's also nice. It lets you play your good cards early and often because you know you're going to be getting rid of most of those other cards and getting a new hand pretty quickly. So Citadel, very effective, very powerful alien, a lot of fun. The next one is from Cosmic Eons, and that is Cloak. Cloak's one of my favorite aliens of all time. It's definitely my favorite alien in that expansion. It's got a lot of text there, um, but that is really because it, there's a few edge case elements that we're trying to cover in the explanation for this, but let's dive in. So you have the power to act unseen. Whenever both sides in an encounter reveal attack cards and the total of those cards is 20 or more, you may use this power. So this does only fire when you get those totals up to 20 or more, but that actually uh, happens uh, pretty frequently. I mean, that you're just looking for two attack 10s or higher, and that is uh, not hard to do. It's pretty easy to hit to 20, so you will have an opportunity to use your cloak ability pretty frequently. So what happens when you do? All players must fan out their hands face down on the table, and then the other players immediately close their eyes and turn away from the table while you count out loud 15 seconds. During this time, you may move one ship, one card, both, or neither. If moving a ship, it must be from a planet to another planet or the warp, or from the warp to a planet. If moving a card, it must be from one player's hand without peeking to another or to the top of the appropriate discard pile, or from the top of a discard pile to a player's hand. As a diversion, you may slightly shift other ships and cards without changing their location, because people are listening, so you're a lot of moving around counting, and you're picking up ships and pretending to move them and uh, touching people's cards and whatnot. After the first 15 seconds are up, count out another 15 seconds while the other players look for the changes you made. They may not touch their cards or discuss, gesture, or communicate with each other in any way. Before time runs out, any one of those players on a first-come, first-served basis may claim that you moved one ship, one card, both, or neither, and must identify either the source or destination for each move. If that player is completely correct, they may either undo any or all changes or receive one reward. If the player is incorrect or no claim is made before time runs out, no changes are undone, and you receive one reward. So Cloak has the ability to really be mischievous in a game. They can try to target somebody who is in a powerful position by attempting to strip one of their foreign colonies uh, or getting rid of a card from their hand or giving them a lousy card from a discard pile. Uh or just weakening a colony by moving uh, it from two ships to one ship or something like that. Or they can help out a player who is behind, including themselves, by giving them a colony or strengthening a weak colony or giving them an extra card uh, or moving a card from one player to another. Uh, a lot that can be done. And because you can do both a card and a ship, anyone guessing has to be right about both. And so sometimes this cloak... I like to just make one change, and it's fairly obvious, but then they can't help themselves, and they think that there's got to be a second change somewhere, so they're not going to be completely right, uh, and if, if they are <laughs> uh, right about the number of things, they still have to be right about the destination or the, or the origination of uh, where a card or ship started or ended, so... Not impossible, and some people have been able to figure things out depending on what's going on. In a large group, it's much harder for the other players to figure these things out because there's so many more things to keep track of. So many more hands, more ships, more planets. Um, so, yeah, it's a, for me, it's a really fun alien to play. Uh, I even don't mind um, having somebody else play Cloak just to sort of see if I can figure out what it is that they're doing. And... Even if you are the sort of person who is good at figuring those things out, 
One, you only have 15 seconds to do so, but you also have to be faster than somebody who else, somebody else who might just say, all right, I know what it is, and they don't, <laughs> or they're just going to be wrong. And um, so Cloak has that going for them as well. It is actually um, not easy for people to catch Cloak every time. And Cloak is going to be able to use that ability uh, fairly regularly. So uh, fun alien to have in the game. Very silly. Serious gamers, you're probably not going to like Cloak as much because it is a little bit chaotic and it is a bit goofy. But that, for me, it's pure cosmic encounter. That's why I love that alien. All right, our next alien is from Cosmic Conflict, and it is Filth. Now, this is kind of a bizarre alien and uh, the way it works is anytime any of your ships are coexisting on the same planet as any other player ships use this power to force the other player ships to return to their other colonies you can never coexist with filth on a planet that means if you're going to make a deal with filth you actually have to vacate your planet out on you you'll say all right land here but then all of your ships are going to have to leave and likewise it's hard for uh, for players to uh, to worry about uh, where they're going to end up. Um, it's actually easy for them to worry about where they're going to end up. But uh, when you your allies in a winning offensive encounter do not land on the defending planet with you. However, they each still gain a colony on any other planet of their choice in the defending system. So Filth can still have allies as the offense. They can say, yeah, come along. But Filth is going to be the only one who lands on that targeted planet if the offense wins. The other players can just land on other planets, and they don't all have to go to the same planet. They can go to whichever one they want, and that creates some really interesting uh, situations and environments in the game. Uh, when you lose an encounter as the defense on a planet where you have ships, use this power to force all opposing ships to return to their other colonies instead of landing on your planet. Your losing ships go to the warp normally, and the planet is then fumigated. So... If someone attacks you on one of your home planets, say, where you have some ships, and you lose, they don't get a colony. They don't get to land. The planet is too stinky. They can't go down there. So this is a, a, it's, it's a really powerful and unusual alien. Now, the downside here, of course, is that you're not necessarily using your alien power uh, very often in the game. Um, but you've got that the constant threat of filth is is definitely palpable in a game even if you're not really doing anything um but you know again as the offense you're going to have a negligible effect on things people are like oh i definitely want to uh, help filth there's no extra advantage to helping filth there's no extra advantage to opposing filth when filth is on the offense. On the defense, on the other hand, you're much more likely to attract allies uh, on the defense if you want them or need them. And sometimes you can just say, oh, great, you know, I'm going to go ahead and and use this encounter to get rid of a card I don't need because I'm not too worried about losing it. Yes, I'm going to lose a few ships. Um, it's a good time to play negotiate, to go ahead and take that compensation from the other player, take their cards, uh, but they're not getting a colony. So it's... Uh, it's usually in their best advantage to make a deal. So as the defense, you've got that leverage of let's get into a deal situation. Otherwise, you're not getting anything. Um, when you agree to trade colonies in a deal, you and that other player must each vacate a planet for the other player to land on. So they, they are going to get something. They can deal with filth. It's, there's no concern about that. But um, the real concern is for anyone attacking you. And um, especially if that player has allies, they're not getting anything either. So... Why, why bother? Why bother going after a planet there? So Filth is another one that I thought about. Oh, do I really keep this on a list Because for as any player? But it's just so much fun to, to play and to watch the other people panic that um, I like having Filth in that game. All right, from Cosmic Odyssey, we have Hertz. And Hertz uh, has the power to lease. Either before or after encounter cards are revealed, but not both. You may use this power to make an offer to lease your ships to each player in the encounter. That's each player. So you can't just say, all right, I'm just going to do it to you, although you can limit yourself to one. But you can make this offer to all the other players. Um, for each player that agrees, heretofore the leasee, take a number of your ships from any of your colonies not involved in the encounter up to the number of ships that the leasee has in that encounter and stack those ships under the leasee ships. Then place one cosmic token on this sheet or two 
if the lease that you have made with that player is after the encounter cards are revealed. So sometimes what you can do is you can say, all right, you know, the cards are played. We haven't revealed them yet. Let's talk about who wants to get a lease. And I'll talk about in a minute what they're going to get out of it. But you've got that, that opportunity to get people to commit to it so that you're going to get only one cosmic token if they agree. Or what happens is sometimes you flip it over and you go, oh my goodness, look how close the encounter totals are. And everyone's played their reinforcements if they have any, but it's still pretty close. And now you've got an opportunity to make leases again to perhaps change the outcome. And now you're going to get two cosmic tokens if they agree. So here's what happens. A leasee's leased ships are treated as their own ships and are worth two for encounter totals and rewards. So that's each one of your hurt ships that you lease to somebody is going to be a plus two for the encounter totals. And if they're a defensive ally, for instance, they're going to get two additional rewards if their side wins. Uh, however, leased ships cannot move unless they move with an equal number of non-leased ships from the same stack. So they're going to still have those leased ships after they make the lease, and they'll be able to use them and bring them around. But remember, they still count as that player's ships. So it's not like they can say, I'm bringing four regular ships and four leased ships if they're if their limits are four. But once they're in the encounter and they make a lease, you can bring in the extra ships uh, above and beyond four. Um, if leased ships no longer have a non-leased ship above them, or if the leasee no longer controls the leased ships for any reason, they return to your colonies. So your leased ships are not really at risk of going to the warp or being captured or removed from the game by other aliens like Void or something like that. Uh, because they'll just return to you when that happens. Once per encounter at any time, you may discard a token from the sheet, either to cancel the lease on all ships for one leasee, returning them to your colonies, or double the number of rewards you gain as a successful defensive ally. So in order to use these tokens as hurts, you're going to have to get yourself in a situation where you are a defensive ally on a winning side and get some rewards because then you can double the number of rewards that you have in there. So you are more incentivized than probably most other aliens to ally with the defense and you can offer your lease to the defending main player or other allies on your side. And so sometimes what happens when I'm hurt, I love to be the first person to ally because I'll join the, 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 the defense and then I'll say, we can do some leases for these other players and you'll get so many more rewards if you do. And that is hard uh, to resist for the other players. And it means that you as Hertz, you're going to get even more rewards than, than the other players in most cases. And of course, you can always just use them to cancel the, uh, the lease. So when you start to see a lot of your own ships opposing you <laughs> because they're bringing, the players are bringing them along as part of their uh, encounter totals since the, the other benefit they get is they can add more to a encounter total by bringing in these Hertz leased ships and they're risking fewer of their own ships. So it's a kind of a double bonus for leasing them. This is an alien that you can ignore. Uh, it, like Lloyd, um, you can just say, no, I'm not going to do it. But again, because the benefit is is pretty good, it's hard, it's hard to resist. And because the tokens that Hertz is getting are not as so easy for them to use, they're not easy for them to get those extra rewards. It's not just you're spending them to get rewards, period. You have to get them as a defensive ally. So um, that is Hertz, which is a pretty powerful alien, a lot of fun to play. It, it really shakes up the game a lot by having it involved. All right, from Cosmic Dominion, is Joker. And Joker is um, a really interesting alien. The way it works is you're going to have these nine Joker tokens that you're going to place on your sheet at the start of the game. And these tokens have different encounter card uh, values on them. So there's one that's a negotiate. There's one that's a retreat, which is a, a new type of encounter card that was introduced in Cosmic Dominion. Uh, and then you'll have a morph, and the rest of them are attack cards, and the attack card values are 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, and 42, which are the lost numbers. Um, so here's how these works. Uh, attack 8 cards are initially wild. Uh, so when you're starting the game as Joker, uh, any attack 8 card that any player has will be considered a wild card when it's revealed. 
and that at the start of your turn, you may name any attack card to become the new wild instead of the attack eight. So you can look at your hand, you can say, well, I don't have any eights, but I've got a couple of tens, or I've got some twelves, or I've got, a, I've got an attack zero. Um, whatever you want, you can make the wild card. Now, after encounter cards are revealed in any encounter, for each one that matches the current wild card, you use this power. Place one face-up joker token from the sheet on the wild card to change it into the card indicated by that token. After the outcome is determined, return the used joker tokens to the sheet face down. When you remove the last face-up joker token from the sheet, immediately turn the used ones face up. So what that means is if any player reveals, let's say, an attack eight, um, you, this is mandatory, must change that into the value of one of your tokens. Uh, and one of them is an eight, but only one of them. And so what that means is you're going to have some control over the outcome of uh, some of these encounters, depending on what token you reveal and what else is going on. If you use your negotiate, well, that player has now revealed a negotiate card, and there's really not a whole lot they can do about it other than Cosmic Zap. Um, and so this makes you a, a very powerful ally, because if a player has a particular wild card, they they know that you can change it, so they're going to want to have you on their side. Um, and when you've got wild cards, you can usually bully everybody into doing what you want. Like I say, let's get into a deal situation, or you guys should join me on the attack because I'm going to turn my wild into an attack 42, um, stuff like that. So Joker, really powerful alien, really interesting and fun to play. It, it's not one that's going to fire every encounter because there's only so many times a wild card can come up. Uh, but because at the start of your turn, you can change it. I, I sometimes I'll say like, all right, you know, who's got multiple copies of a card? Let's find out. I'll make that the wild card. And then we can uh, we can ally together. And players, um, yeah, sometimes they're like, oh, I can get information out of them if nothing else. So um, it's a really interesting uh, and different alien. So I like that one. All right, from Cosmic Odyssey, we have Negator. And Negator is an essence alien. This is going to be one that uses those essence cards. Uh, you have the power to negate. Once per encounter, you may use this power to play a negation from your essence card cash on another player as per the timing on the negation. Um, and so these negations, they're going to be things like uh, when somebody points the hyperspace gate at a particular planet, you can play the negation and you can say you have to pick a different planet. When they are choosing an encounter card to play down in the planning phase, you can say, no, you have to choose a different encounter card. When they play uh, an artifact, you can say you can't play that artifact, you have to play a different one if you can, um, and, and, and stuff like that. It, it even works on optional alien powers for a main player or for ally. And so the Gator has a, 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 a lot of options. They're always going to have three to choose from at any given moment. And so because of that, you're able to really see what's going on and keep track of the possibilities you'll see when somebody does something they can say yeah i'm gonna bring um these two ships and you can say no you have to bring ships from a different planet and you have to bring a different number as well uh so the neg negations here um because they're all fairly straightforward um and and there's always almost always going to be one you can play every encounter a negator can stay involved and always have something to do uh throughout the game so i i enjoy that I think making Negator, in essence, Alien really helped make this power more interesting and gets used more often. Uh, we have another essence uh, alien, and that is Oligarch. And Oligarch comes from Cosmic Eons. Whoops. And the way it works is at the setup, you're going to have five privilege cards as your card cache, and you automatically start the game as the first player. That's interesting. So you have the power of greed. Every time you draw a new hand of cards, including at the beginning of the game, draw one additional card. So you're already starting off with some stuff that has nothing to do with your essence cards. You're the first player. You have a larger hand than everyone else. And then you accumulate privileges up to the highest number of foreign colonies that has been reached by any player. Use this power whenever any one player has more foreign colonies than number of your face-up privilege cards. So at the start of the game, as soon as somebody gets a foreign colony, you're going to be able to use one of your privilege cards. And uh, the privilege cards for Oligarch, they they give Oligarch uh, some kind of bonus and they give everyone else some kind of penalty. So one of them, for instance, is 
you need one fewer colonies, uh, foreign colonies, to win the game. And everyone else needs one more. <laughs> so it's like a double whammy because you're getting uh, one uh, perk and everyone else is getting the opposite. Um, you, Whenever you get rewards, you get more rewards and the other players get fewer rewards or same thing with compensation. So that's how the privileges work. They, It's not just a privilege, but it's also um, a handicap that the other players are going to get. Um, and then it says here that... Um, if you are zapped, the privilege you attempted to play is removed from the game. So that's another difference from how uh, essence cards normally work. So Oligarch kind of breaks the mold on your standard approach to essence cards. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty powerful. It's one that people are going to save their cosmic zaps for. Um, in terms of you know, you're going to be able to use your power at any time. This is another one where it's not it's not every encounter. You're not going to be doing it all the time, but as those privileges start to become uh, activated, you and everyone else is going to feel the effects of oligarchs. So it, it is one that is very much in your face because it doesn't really matter how well oligarch is doing. As soon as somebody gets to two foreign colonies, you're unlocking another privilege. As soon as somebody gets to three foreign colonies, you're unlocking another privilege. So it's uh, it's constantly going to be uh, activated and then you're you're reaping the rewards of those privileges uh, unless they get zapped but that can only happen so many times so you are going to get those privileges and it's going to make you more and more powerful and more and more likely to win the game all right from cosmic dominion we have pentaform pentaform another pretty bizarre alien so here's how pentaform works at the game setup you're going to draw five flares from the flare deck and arrange the matching alien powers uh, in front of you as life stages uh, in any order that you choose. Uh, and then if you've got game setup text or uh, it can't be allowed, you'll draw again. And then you're going to remove those five flares from the game and you, you put the peniform sheet somewhere where everyone can see it. Um, so the way it works is you have the power to evolve. You have both your peniform power and whichever life stage uh, it is underneath. So it's going to be moving around uh, depending on the life stages. Whenever you gain a foreign colony, you're going to use this power to move this sheet one life stage to the right. And whenever you lose a foreign colony, you'll move it to the left. So you're basically taking these five aliens and you're deciding which ones you want to use depending on how well you're doing in the game. So uh, aliens that will help you get those first couple of colonies, maybe those are your first life stages. And so once you get that, you'll move on to another one. And then maybe the later ones are going to be the ones that help you to ultimately win the game. So you've got you've got that bit of latitude there in terms of deciding the order of them. Um, and everyone can kind of see uh, how that plays out. Um, this is a little bit different than how we played Peniform in the Mayfair edition, which is where it first appeared. Um, and it may just be that was how we interpreted the text or who knows why. But the way we did it was we drew the five alien sheets secretly. So nobody knew which five we had. And we made a stack of them. So you knew what the first stage was. And when Pendaform got a, a foreign colony, you would move to the next one and people go, oh my goodness, now, now you're antimatter. And then you go to the next one. Oh my God, now you're virus. And so it worked that way. Um, but this is this is what we ended up with in uh, in Cosmic Dominion, which still works fine. It's still a powerful and fun alien. Um, but I we typically house rule it to do it the Mayfair way when we're playing it um, here in my house anyway. So it's the part of the fun is just trying to figure out what order you want to do those life stages in because you are preferably finding a way to ramp up so that you get um, stronger as the game goes on and uh, can help you get to the next life stage so that you can win the game. Um, so yes, it, it, is it one that you're, you, you're doing something every encounter? Maybe, maybe not. It's going to depend largely on the life stages, but it's something that's going to be changing throughout the game, which makes Pendiform really interesting, uh, even in a large group. All right, from Cosmic Odyssey, we have Throwback. And Throwback, as you can plainly see, is going to be a strange alien to play. Um, so this one is a is a bit of a nod to the original Eon edition of Cosmic Encounter. This is a, what the alien sheets looked like back then. Um, and this art is even from the Eon edition of Cosmic Encounter. That is the old Oracle, the original Oracle art. So 
this alien not only looks like the way things were, but wants to play things the way they are. So it's the power of anachronism. Uh, whenever you draw a hand, including your starting hand, draw seven cards instead of eight, because that's how it used to be. It wasn't until the Fantasy Flight Edition that your hands were eight cards. Uh, when speaking, you should refer to colonies as bases, ships as tokens, encounters as challenges, encounter cards as challenge cards, artifacts as edicts, negotiate cards as compromise cards, compensation as consolation, and the hyperspace gate as the cone. When other players use the modern terms, you may correct them by saying the proper turn, and once per challenge, you may use this power to receive one reward when you correct another player in this way. So once per, per encounter, or once per challenge, as it says on the sheet, you're going to be able to use this power, and you're going to get a reward. And unless you're playing with the most uh, militant, strictest, probably a lot of old-time players, uh, it's going to be very easy for you to use your power and get a reward every encounter. So throwback is going to fire all the time. You're going to be correcting people multiple times per encounter. And some players, like one of the uh, the online uh, champions, uh, Mary Jean, who is very good at goading players into saying them because she'll, th she'll say things like, oh, yeah, um, well, well, what did you call that again? And they say, oh, yeah, my ships. And then she'll, ha, ha, I've, I've tricked you once again into saying the modern term. Um, additionally, throwback has this extra bit of fluff. Uh, at any time, you may use this power to purge from your hand one or more modern cards, um, having a card type other than attack, compromise, flare, edict, uh, or kicker. So that would be like a reinforcement card or one of the fancy pants cards from a uh, reward deck. Uh, a card back not matching the cosmic deck, so rewards, uh, or an attack value other than 0, 4 to 10, 12 to 18, 20, 30, or 40. So, uh, sorry, not even of the 0, 1. Um, the 0 is not a card that showed up in the Eon edition. Um, you may just discard these cards and draw an equal number of cards. You may give these cards to another player or trade them to other players for anything they could give you as part of a deal. So if you've got reinforcements in your hand, you can say, all right, I'll give you these reinforcements right now for, an, for a colony or give me something that you know is of equal value. Um, you may also play any number of flares per challenge, even playing the same flare more than once if the context for playing it comes up more than once. Because, again, that's how it was in the Eon days. You could play multiple flares. You could say, I'm playing this flare again because this thing happened. Um, so Throwback is um, a bit of a nutty uh, character. Uh, very fun to play. Um, it, can, it can get on people's nerves for sure. Um, but, you know, it's pure cosmic. That's, that's why I like it. And then our last one, also from Cosmic Odyssey, is the Zilch. And the Zilch is also an essence alien from this uh, expansion. So at the start of the game, you are going to secretly choose a destiny card that matches a player color that does not have a hazard warning on it and place it face down on the sheet. That player is ordained. And essentially what you're doing is you're picking the player that you think is going to win the game. Um, so you have the power of Zilch. Once per encounter, you may use this power to play a fate card from your essence card cache. If the ordained player wins the game alone, you win the game with them. And if the ordained player would be part of a shared win that does not include you, the Zilch, then you win by yourself instead. And you may still win the game via the normal method. And the, uh, the essence cards for Zilch are going to be ways for them to covertly help the player who has been chosen as the ordained. There's one that lets... Um, they, you're basically playing it as a cosmic zap. There's one that would let you... Um, shield somebody from being cosmic zapped. There's one that lets you um, give some of the rewards that you gain to another player or take a card from somebody and after looking at it, give it to another player. Um, now, at the beginning of the game, Zilch is probably going to want to be a bit uh, coy about who it is that they've chosen as the ordained. Um, that way, the other players can't won't necessarily gang up to make sure, you know, if they picked yellow, let's make sure yellow doesn't win. Um, so sometimes you'll help somebody to get to just throw people off. You're like, oh, thanks for helping yellow. And then you're like, really, it was orange that I picked. And so 
You want to try to get them to the point where they are going to win the game so that you can win with them. Or ideally, you're helping them win with somebody else. It does make the joint wins a little bit of a nerve-wracking experience because players know, oh, if I if I help Yellow win this game and they have been chosen as the ordained, then I'm not going to win. It will Zilch will win the game alone. Um, Zilch is an alien that used to be part of the Eon edition. It did not have a sheet. It was just something that you... You basically, at the start of the game, you wrote down the name of the player that you thought would win, and then you are able to look at stuff and tell people whatever you want. It was still pretty fun to play, but we felt there was there was a way to make Zilch into an alien that had a sheet and had a physical manifestation of how it would play out. So, Zilch, uh, you are probably going to be able to do something most encounters. Not every encounter. Um, so, I, I actually did a pretty poor job, I think, assembling 10 aliens that you can use every encounter, but... That wasn't really, really the goal. It was just aliens that were fun to play as any player uh, that potentially could do something just about every encounter. So these are just aliens I really love, and they happen to be as any player, which helps out. Uh, it's fun having them in the game. Let me know what your favorite as any player aliens are that are red alert or whatever, um, and stuff that you think probably should have been on this list, or what you think of these aliens on my list, and uh, you know whether or not you agree. Thanks for watching and keep zapping.